Dear Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to Future Talk 2020, live from Bern. Welcome to all our distinguished guests here in Bern, and also to everybody watching us online from around the globe. My name is Dorothy Gelmar. I'm looking forward to guide you through the course of our conference today. And we have a great program, a great agenda set up for all of you. We say all good things are three. It's the third day of Future Talk here in Bern. In the last days, we focused on the green education, on STEAM or STEM education. And today, it's all about AI, artificial intelligence. For all our guests here in Bern, we have for sure prepared a safety concept. So thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. And all people who joined us yesterday or the day before, you know that we have a hybrid dialogue event where the guests, the panelists, the experts, the speakers join us here on site in Bern or via video call from all around the world. Yeah, for all of you following us on our um, YouTube channel or um, on our event app, Hoover, you can use the comment function to interact with us. We have panels, two panels for today, and we want to interact with you. So leave a comment, leave a question, leave a statement, use the Hoover app for that, or also the comment function on YouTube, and we can interact together. We also have prepared a poll, which is running for the last uh, days, and for sure we will also reveal the answers this afternoon. You can download the app during a link on our futuretalk.org website. But now let's start the afternoon with the welcoming words on behalf of World Didec, the president of World Didec, who will join us live from Indonesia. We say hi to Steve McKee. Welcome to our viewers and participants from around the world for this final day of the World Didact Future Talk. I hope that you've been enjoying the previous two days as much as I have. I found it very, very interesting. Today we have a complex and interesting topic on artificial intelligence, Industry 4.0, and digital learning as well as the future of work. We have some wonderful speakers and sessions today which will explore all these issues. I know it sounds like a lot to cover, and it is, but it is all related and connected. In education, there are two sides for us concerning the issue about artificial intelligence. The first is how, when, and where to teach AI. AI is a major tool and integral component of IR 4.0. and It is important for our educational systems to teach this as a skill as well as a vocation. This will help to create a workforce that can help drive the transformation in industry. Countries that do a poor job in this area will find that their industries will be stuck with older technologies, become less effective and efficient and less competitive, and be left behind. The second issue is the impact of AI and digital learning on education. Can it be the catalyst to transform our educational systems, and if so, in what way? Our two panels today will address these issues. To begin with, though, we have our opening by Mario Maruzzi, the Ambassador for the State Secretariat for Education, Research and Innovation, followed by the Ambassador from Finland to Switzerland. Then to set the background and to inform us about global developments, we have the distinguished guest speaker from UNIDO, Cecilia Ugaz Estrada, who is then followed by our special inspirational futurist, Garrett Leonhard. I'm really looking forward to all their presentations and statements. In the first panel session, we will discuss about AI and its impact on societies and work and IR 4.0 and its implications. As industries change towards increasingly more automated factories, we may see what I call the second wave of globalization. This would be characterized again by shifting economies, shifting wealth, shifting production locations, new jobs arising and old ones disappearing. Workers will once again be displaced, replaced and need to be retrained. In the first wave of globalization, we saw industry relocate from developed countries with high labor costs to lesser developed countries with lower labor costs. It was a boon for the developing world and has been one of the major underpinning forces behind raising billions of people out of poverty during the last few decades. This time, the second wave, we may see that flow reverse a bit. As labor-intensive factories are automated, the location of these factories will be reconsidered. 
low labor costs will not be the key deciding factor any longer. Instead, considerations may be access to highly skilled labor, which is required to keep those advanced machinery running. Also, supply chain issues like proximity to raw sources of materials or final market destinations may be of strategic consideration. The locations where all these factors combine will become the new sweet spots or investments over the next coming decades. The second session deals with the impact of AI on education itself and the increasing role of digital and online learning. This is what some are calling Education 4.0. This is a favorite topic of mine as I think that digital learning in its various aspects is the key to improving and transforming education. Industry has experienced recent major transformations with the development of smart factories, smart cities, smart hospitals, and smart services. Social communication has transformed to where we rely upon technology to keep in touch with our family and our friends. Yet digital learning until recently has often been treated as a novelty or used only for supplemental learning, and in many schools around the world, it's not even yet used at all. Then enters COVID. This pandemic has brought this issue to the forefront as now showing how important digital learning can be to make our education systems more resilient and I believe more effective. This might be the one good thing that comes from the pandemic, if we can say that it has raised the importance and awareness of digital learning. In the recent rush towards this digital learning, it was found out that many schools, institutions, and countries were inadequately prepared. What I mean by this is that they did not have the infrastructure, the platforms, the bandwidth, the devices, the content, nor the curriculum. We also found out painfully that many of our teachers and administrators did not have the knowledge or the skills to implement such systems. This is what we have to correct. We need to have a more methodical, and more holistic way of implementing digital learning one that addresses all aspects and includes continuous support and training for teachers and updating both pre-service and in-service uh, teachers and training programs. Perhaps now is the time for smart education. As we implement the digital learning environment, we can look forward to using AI as part of our educational resources and toolkit. It can be used to create knowledge banks, experts that are similar to what IBM has done with Watson in the medical field. It can be used to assist students on their learning journeys by monitoring how they learn and then offering up materials in a variety of ways that they prefer. It can test to recognize prior knowledge and create faster learning pathways for the student so that he does not have to relearn things he already knows. It can also find out what knowledge or skills the student lacks and continue to work with them until they master it. These techniques and tools may finally enable us to implement differentiated and adaptive learning and move away from linear group learning to multi-pathway, non-linear, individualized learning. AI can help bring personalized learning and assessments, which will not only strengthen competency, but speed up the learning process. I'm sure that our future is scared will have some interesting comments for us surrounding these topics. The development of high quality digital learning systems and content can help level the educational playing field globally. It can aid teachers to deliver higher standard learning to rural or disadvantaged areas, which can result in better opportunities for the students. To develop these new systems, content and tools, it takes investment, and these resources need to be adapted to each country's needs. Digital learning should be prioritized in new educational initiatives and funding. In the TVET area alone, we estimate that for every dollar that's put into digital learning, it will have the same impact as the equivalent of $10 of investment in traditional bricks and mortar development. We can do more, we can reach more, and it can cost less. It is my hope that in the near future we can finally do away with time-based and age-based learning in favor of personalized learning, learning that occurs when and where you need it throughout your lifetime. I call this just-in-time learning. This is what the new pedagogy is and what we educators are calling Hutagogy or Learning 4.0. This is what educational transformation looks like and is what many of our members at World IDEC are doing now to bring new concepts into reality to develop a new generation of tools, contents, and systems for use by the world. Before leaving, I would like to share with you a framework or roadmap for planning of digital learning that we use to divide up activities, investments, and efforts and energy into three areas. We call this the 3I approach. Infrastructure, infrastructure, and infoculture. 
Infrastructure is well known as the first thing that is normally addressed. It includes hardware such as PCs, laptops, uh, tablets or smartphones, bandwidth or access to bandwidth, networks and support. Infrastructure includes the platforms like learning management systems, classroom management systems, school management systems, digital content, assessments and software. The last of the three I's is perhaps the most important and is the one that is often most overlooked. We call it infoculture. This forms the ability to use those other two elements together to conduct digital learning effectively. It is about the infusion of digital learning into the curriculum, upgrading the teacher skills in digital technology and supporting them in the long term. It is about school and learning policies and change management. All three areas of the three I's need to be balanced and implemented in order to have successful and effective outcome. I will leave you with that thought. So let's begin the session and let our imaginations roam together and be inspired by your speakers today. I will be monitoring the chat feeds on the WOVA app and the YouTube channel, so please let us have your comments during the sessions and we will do our best to answer them. I hope you enjoyed today's presentations, panels, and discussions. Thank Thanks, you very much. Zoe. Thanks for these motivating words. Thanks for welcoming us, welcoming our guests. Thank you for tuning in from Indonesia. Let's now move on to the welcoming words brought to us by our Swiss government representative for today's session, who is here live in Bern. I say hello to the Ambassador of the International Relations at the State Secretariat for Education, Research and Innovation, Mr. Mauro Moruzzi. Hello and good to have you here. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for the applause so that uh, we can really prove that we are here in person. <clears throat> so Excellencies, Mr. Ambassador of Finland, dear Timo, Madam Chief Advisor at UNIDO, Senora Cecilia Augas Estrada, distinguished speakers and members of the panels, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome from my side also to everybody. It is a true pleasure and for me to stand in front of you today at Future Talk 2020. I am honored and delighted to have been asked to open today's session on artificial intelligence. First of all, I would like to thank World Didac Association and the people who contributed to the organization of this event. Madam Ugas Estrada, we are very happy that UNIDO has partnered with World Didac Association for today's event because Switzerland and UNIDO enjoy an excellent relationship. Federal Councillors Guy Parmelin and Ignazio Cassis had the pleasure of meeting your Director General, Mr. Lee Young, in Bern this September to speak about the impact of COVID-19 and the ongoing reforms of the United Nations system. I would also like to extend a special greeting to my dear friend, Ambassador Timo Rajakangas. Finland and Switzerland have an excellent and fruitful relationship in general but they enjoy especially strong ties in the field of education, research and innovation. Both countries being recognized, for instance, as leaders in the field of innovation. It is certainly not by chance that our State Secretary that you also heard here at World Didac, Martina Hirayama, decided as one of her very few missions abroad in her first year in charge to visit Finland last November among other things, to attend in Helsinki the renowned Slush Conference dedicated to startups. Last but not least, I would like to welcome the distinguished, sorry, distinguished speakers and participants of this afternoon's session. Thank you all for joining today to share with us your thoughts and insightful ideas during the discussion that are going to take place in a few minutes. Innovation. This is a much talked about concept, isn't it? Some would say a very convenient, fashionable concept, very vague enough, but trendy. Well, for a country like Switzerland, things are pretty clear. If we want to ensure prosperity to our citizens, we have no choice but to be innovative. The lack of natural resources, high production costs, and the small size of our internal market force us to always find new ideas, products, and services if we want to remain competitive abroad, create job in a country, and ultimately assure the welfare of our society. 
As Switzerland is regularly ranked as one of the most innovative countries in the world, we are often asked to share the recipe for this success. As a matter of fact, the Swiss way of innovating is indeed a very specific, but actually a very simple one. Our innovation policy is subsidiary, meaning that it relies on the key principle of a bottom-up approach based on competition, collaboration, and efficiency. Now, hearing that, you may conclude that the direct role of the government in innovation is minor. Well, you are perfectly right. When I speak to an international audience, I usually say that the so-called secret or recipe is so obvious that we don't see it. Switzerland, its government, the state, does not and should not promote or enforce a specific, proactive, top-down designed innovation policy. This because innovation stems first and foremost from the private sector and from individuals motivated to freely test their ideas on real ground. In Switzerland, two out of three Swiss francs invested in research and innovation originate from private sources. Now, to be completely frank, the federal government does have a role in innovation, and even a crucial one. But it is an indirect role. The state authorities need to guarantee appropriate framework conditions for innovative entrepreneurs to succeed. Excellent infrastructures, including digital ones, a trustworthy and stable legal framework, including reliable political institutions, are just a few of these fundamental framework con conditions. Another of these framework conditions, and not the least, not the least, brings us back to today's event and to you, ladies and gentlemen. To pave the ground for successful innovation, we need a competitive workforce and a first-class education system. And that is exactly why we are here today at Future Talk. As you all know, today more than ever, cooperation is crucial when addressing global challenges. Such cooperation is particularly important in the context of today's topic of artificial intelligence. To ensure that specific needs, challenges, and opportunities of the education sector are taken into account, education stakeholders should be in constant dialogue with AI experts and researchers. G digitalization, the Industry 4.0, and the Internet of Things are some of the major transformations that our economies, our education systems, and society as a whole will have to address. The size and the pace of transformation and its disruptive potential are substantial and are already having a major, major impact on individuals, business and society. It is a chance, but also a challenge, and we therefore need to stay at the forefront of these developments. AI brings with it an enormous opportunities for improving teaching and learning processes. So far, AI is still relatively uncommon in educational practice, but this can change very quickly. It creates additional possibilities, for instance, through the automatic evaluation of tests or learning analytics that allow for a more individualized learning experience. The spread of AI and digitalization more generally has implications for the skills that individuals need to have in order to live and work in a digitized society. The increasing use of data in education also raises ethical issues. We need to ask ourselves what the data culture in education should look like. Who should be allowed to collect and process how much data, from whom, for what purposes? Finally, we also need to guarantee that inclusivity is taken into account by AI in education. If we think of SDG 5, gender equity, for instance, it is obvious that equal opportunities and the inclusion of women and girls in the research production and application of AI must be assured. An interesting example in this context is the workshop series Towards an Inclusive Future in AI, which was run by the Swiss Next Network, Forhouse and AI Commons last year. The proposal resulting from those workshops highlighted the key roles that education plays in ensuring an inclusive future in AI. We need to equip individuals with the knowledge and skills they need 
in order for them to be able to participate in an AI-based economy and society. By bringing together many of the global stakeholders in education, Future Talks give us an excellent opportunity to join forces and further explore these topics to exchange, discuss, and find innovative and sustainable solutions in support of the decade of action towards the Sustainable Development Goals and the Agenda 2030. I wish us all an inspiring afternoon with many interesting contacts and new ideas, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks so much for these welcoming words, Mr. Maruzzi. Thank you for being here in Bern. Yeah, as you may know, we have three embassy hosts for three days of Future Talk. We had Canada on the first day, we had Korea on the second day, and today our embassy host is Finland. And I'm honored to welcome the embassy host, the ambassador of Finland in Switzerland, Timo Rajakangas, joining us via video call. Dear Future Talk participants, ladies and gentlemen, two years ago, my country had the honor to be invited as the special guest country to the World Didac Education Exhibition and Conference held here in Bern. And then, our focus was on lifelong learning. I am happy to see that the good collaboration started then between Finland and the World Didact continues this year within the framework of the Future Talk event created by World Didact. It is indeed with great pleasure and excitement that the Embassy of Finland is hosting the third day of the Future Talk today with the focus on artificial intelligence. For the Finnish Embassy in Switzerland, AI is a natural and very appropriate topic, as both Finland and Switzerland are world leaders in the field of AI. Our two countries are natural and close partners, and in the field of AI, we will surely find avenues for even further fruitful cooperation. Dear participants, what is sure about the future in the short as well as in the long run is that we face great challenges and uncertainty is probably the best word to describe what is to come. A pandemic is raging across the globe, the world economy is on its knees and the climate change overshadows our whole existence. However, how gloomy as our future may seem, we have all the reason to believe that as before, at troubled times, the challenges will be overcome. And in that equation, the incredible strides, strides of the past decades in technology, such as the gigantic leaps in AI, will play a decisive role. Once again, the challenges will call us to excel as problem solvers. And the key to success is the same as it was yesterday, as it is today, and it will be in the future, education. During her whole existence as a nation, Finland has put a great emphasis on education. It has been the natural choice for a small nation that just over 100 years ago gained her independence as a primarily agrarian country with hardly any natural resources. From early on, it was realized that the people are our most valuable asset, and our only chance to succeed was to invest in them. Our education system was built on the principle of providing for a solid basic education for every child, regardless of economic background or place of birth. Over the years, we have been able to realize a remarkable return on our investment in people, as, for example, proven by the remarkable scores of Finnish school children in the well-known PISA studies. The most recent proof of the success of our education system was the score given to Finland last week in the Economist's 
Worldwide Education for the Future Index. Finland ranked as number one. This index measures how well countries prepare their youth for the challenges of the future, at work and in life, in terms of digital skills, creativity, communication, social skills, and critical thinking. I was also glad to notice that Finland finished at the top for the income adjusted ranking, which shows that providing youth with the best education is not just about resources, but about dedication, the right approach and vision. Ladies and gentlemen, Finland is known not only for its success in education, but also as a country of high technology and innovation. Obviously, there is a link between the two, success in education and success in innovation. To world fame in this regard, Finland began to rise in the 1980s and 1990s, when for the first time, a technological consumer product, Nokia mobile phones, advanced rapidly to a market leader position all across the world. Nokia's success brought with it, of course, immediate economic benefits to Finland, but perhaps even more important for the longer term was that Nokia served as a kind of a training platform or, if you like, breeding ground for IT specialists. These highly specialized innovative professionals went after the Nokia boom on to use their expertise, experience and know-how to start new businesses. And so one of the most flourishing startup scenes in Europe emerged in Finland at the beginning of the new millennium. The Finnish universities quickly realized that they could support such a development by offering startup programs for their students. And today, there is no lack of such opportunities in the Finnish education institutes. One of the most successful startup companies that grew out of these support programs originated from the Aalto University. It is Slush, a student-driven company that excels in bringing together startups and investors from all over the world to a leading startup conference that takes place in Helsinki every November. Slush has grown from a 300-person assembly in 2008 to a community of a truly global magnitude with more than 20,000 visitors at each annual gathering. The mission of Slush is to create and help the next generation of groundbreaking entrepreneurs. The success of Slush has been recognized also here in Switzerland. I am very happy that the Swiss State Secretariat for Education, Research and Innovation is today an active partner of Slush, supporting dozens of Swiss startups in participating at Slush and thereby having become part of this worldwide startup ecosystem. Dear participants, let me come back to what World Deduct is all about, education. For future talk, perhaps the most relevant and interesting startup ecosystem that has grown rapidly in Finland in the, land, in the last 10 years or so is the digital edtech platform ecosystem. It is a program aiming at supporting the renewal of the Finnish top-level education system by benefiting from the innovation capacity of education and technology companies, which in turn creates new business opportunities for the companies concerned. If there is one thing that the corona crisis has clearly brought about in the field of education, it is the realization that the digital disruption has started. The experiences made during the crisis have certainly prepared the ground 
for the digital transition in education. We in Finland welcome this change and we stand ready for it. We have a lot of promising educational technology companies with a strong pedagogic competence. In addition, we have a lot of competence within ICT, 5G, augmented reality, cybersecurity, blockchain and AI technology. We have world-class teachers and a world-class administration who wish to further the digi digitalization. We have already invested in building platform solutions, learning analytics and ecosystems such as the digital edtech platform ecosystem. As we Finns truly believe in the power of collaboration and partnerships, both nationally and internationally, we are ready to share our know-how with the world. A good example of our preparedness to share and partner has to do with the topic of today, AI. Adhering to the Finnish inclusive education approach, the University of Helsinki, in cooperation with a Finnish IT company, Reactor, has made a couple of years ago the online course, Elements of AI, available for everyone free of charge. Last year, during Finland's EU presidency, we made the course available for all Europeans by translating it into all EU languages. As AI influences the lives of us all, we firmly believe that the knowledge of this technology should be available for everyone for the sake of democracy. The first course has already been a great success with over 500,000 att attendees. And we hope that the new course, Building AI, launched just last month, will inspire many more. Also you, all of you, can find both courses on the website elementsofai.com. Dear Future Talk participants, in my welcoming remarks, I have tried to highlight the Finnish approach to education, its relation to our capability to tackle the challenges of today and the future, and its relation to innovation and successful startup ecosystems, some of which then again play a key role in preparing our education systems to continue to be relevant in the age of digitalization and artificial intelligence. Once again, we wish to share these experiences of ours with the world community, and I find Future Talk to be an ideal platform in this regard allowing for interaction between all parties committed to preparing the young generation for the challenges of the new normal in the 21st century. I wish you all a successful, interesting, inspiring afternoon with Future Talk, a talk that is bound to continue in the future. Ms. Raya Kangas, thank you very much yeah, for your encouraging words. Thanks for being part of Future Talk today. And thank you to you and your colleagues uh, for being our embassy host at Future Talk 2020. Now I'd like to go on with our keynote for today. I'm happy to introduce our partner from UNIDO the UN Industrial Development Organization. I'm happy to welcome the chief advisor of UNIDO, Mrs. Cecilia Ugas Estrada, who is joining us via video call. Ladies and gentlemen, warm greetings from the headquarters of the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. In a time where the COVID-19 pandemic has made us question many of our practices, the present session is an excellent opportunity to reflect widely on how we can capitalize 
on the post-pandemic era and to speed up the digital transformation in an inclusive manner to build more resilient societies. As we face the fourth industrial revolution, we are not only confronted by immediate impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also what UN Secretary General Guterres has called the most important systemic threat in relation to the global economy, the climate crisis. First, it is important to harness the enormous potential of the fourth industrial revolution for climate-friendly technologies. The emergence of electric vehicles, digital communications, and 3D printing can significantly reduce environmental footprint. On the other hand, the circular economy model, which is both restorative and regenerative by design, promotes greener industries through efficient use of materials, along with the reduction and elimination of waste. The fourth industrial revolution could enable the circular economy, which in turn could foster new business models that protect the Earth's finite resources and provide innovative solutions for the climate crisis we are facing. We know from ample research that climate change and environmental degradation disproportionately affect the most vulnerable and disadvantaged. While technological innovations in sectors such as health and banking can have far-reaching benefits for equality, many low-skill and routine jobs in manufacturing are at risk of automation, or rather, they will require a new skill set. This bears the risk of job polarization with enhanced wage inequality as a result. If nothing changes, women are especially likely to fall behind. They are disproportionately represented in the middle to low skill jobs and are expected to benefit less from the new jobs of a, of a post fourth industrial revolution world. The World Economic Forum estimates that at current levels of gender equality, men will gain one new job for every three jobs lost due to the fourth industrial revolution, while women will only gain one new job for five jobs lost. In the areas that provide the highest on average wages, namely science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, STEM, the disparity is even higher, with one new STEM job created for four jobs lost for men compared to 20 jobs lost for women. This, is not only, this not only exacerbates economic inequality between genders, but may also affect the productivity of the sector. Numerous studies show that companies with a diverse workforce and management perform better. So how can we ensure that the education sector responds to the needs of the workforce of tomorrow? First, a good basic education remains paramount. We need to continue our efforts to ensure that no one is left behind in the formal education system, be it due to the gender, disability, ethnic origins, or poor infrastructure. Digital skills conveyed by well-trained teachers and with adequate ICT infrastructure for practical learning should be part of every curriculum. Second, it is important to provide lifelong learning opportunities and target technical and vocational training for those whose work is most vulnerable to the changes brought about by the fourth industrial revolution technologies. For example, in Uruguay, UNIDO, in collaboration with Festo Didactic, supported the government in the establishment of the Center of Industry Automation and Mechatronics, CAIME. Targeting both workers and university students, the center offers training in automation technologies to help local industries with technical knowledge, best practices, and quality management. And third, collaboration and partnerships between the public and the private sector, academia, and civil society are key. For example, Twinning projects can strengthen a specific field of research in an emerging institution. Similarly, private sector support to local research centers 
has the double benefit of developing local for industrial revolution knowledge and skills that can help companies to adapt technologies to local circumstances. As countries start planning for post-pandemic economic recovery, let's ensure that education and training meet the challenges of the fourth industrial revolution era, that workers can upgrade their skills to take on new responsibilities, and that women, vulnerable groups, and the global south are not left behind. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much to our partner, Unido. Ladies and gentlemen, by the way, if you want to get more information about our speakers, about our panelists, about our experts, you can find all biographies of our panelists and so on on our website, futuretalk.org. And if you want to share your thoughts, your experiences, for sure, we have a hashtag. Please use the hashtag futuretalk2020. And now let's have a look into the future all together with our futurist, which also joined us the last days. It, his name is Gerd Leonard, and for sure, today he will focus on AI, artificial intelligence, and digitalization. And here he is, Mr. Gerd Leonhardt. Hi, I'm Gerd Leonhardt again. Thanks for tuning in for the third time at Future Talk in Bern. And this will be my third round to speak about artificial intelligence and uh, the future and what that means for education and work. So thanks very much, and we hope to distribute the video also to, to all of you uh, and as, a, as a giveaway, so you can watch it again if you wish. So let's define artificial intelligence again. Uh, it's a great definition I have here from Tem Demis Hassab, the CEO of DeepMind in London, now owned by Google, that says artificial intelligence really is computer system that turn information and data into knowledge, leading us to what he calls, what many people call, the cognitive systems era. Imagine a machine that can turn things into knowledge. Isn't that what makes us human, knowledge? Well, it turns out that's not the only thing that makes us human. Because knowledge is all different kinds of knowledge, and I'll talk about that shortly, but what kind of knowledge do machines have? Well, binary knowledge, you know, calculating knowledge, logical knowledge. Will that eventually change? Probably. But for the time being, that's what machines do. Right? We are not binary. Uh, we're not data, we're not machines, and machines are binary, right? And so the questions that come up when you think about knowledge and education and training, what about tacit knowledge, the stuff that we know uh, that we don't talk about, that's not explicit, right? implicit knowledge, stuff between the lines, embodied knowledge, things that is like embodied intelligence and social intelligence, unknown knowledge. Right? Martin Minsky has, a, Minsky has a great quote on this word, I'll share with you later. And imaginative knowledge, the knowledge of being able to imagine something that is not real. It's, I mean, that's not yet real. <laughs> Foresight, right, and, and understanding. And this is basically what we do as humans. Right? Looking at this chart, it shows what people around the world are thinking and the likelihood of uh, 50 years of robots and computers replacing the work done by humans. In Greece, the highest probability that people think Probably and definitely, it's a, a huge chunk, almost 80%, right? Japan, Canada, and here we are, the United States has the lowest, the most optimistic outlook on this, but clearly that's a worry. You know, machines are going to take over, they're going to do what we used to do. What do we actually do with them? Are we all going to lose our work? Well, unlikely, right? And that is because really what's happening is that a machine is very good at anything that's really hard for us including lots of information and, and looking at the trillion data feeds. That's not what we do. And uh, Luciani Foridi, who is a great researcher in this turf, uh, he um, showed me a quote about uh, maybe three or four years ago saying that algorithms outperform humans when it's not about understanding emotional states, intentions, interpretations, deep semantic skills, consciousness, self-awareness. In other words, the things that make us human. That's what makes us cognitive, conscious, and what makes us exist. That's what machines don't do. And I think ultimately this is really what we have to focus on because machines will be able to do pretty much anything else. Uh, basically routine work is going to be given to the machines and this uh, slide is uh, three years old, I'm showing to you by purpose because it's non-routine cognitive work already increasing on this uh, slide and 
and that includes the non-routinal manual work, but anything that's routine is already decreasing, right? And quite clearly when we're looking at this, you know, what humans do is exactly the opposite. We do the non-routine stuff, you know, curiosity, foresight, purpose, critical thinking. Try to find a computer with purpose. Right? Good luck. I mean, a computer could always pretend to have purpose, like, like they do already. Right? And again, an old slide from the World Economic Forum talking about the new skills. And here we are in 2020, and they are here, right? It's all about critical thinking, creativity, emotional intelligence, cognitive flexibility. It's not so much about the logic only, and the, 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 the firepower of the brain. Right? It's about the imaginative power of the brain. And that's true, I think, no matter what position you're in, whether you're talking about kindergarten or schools or colleges or, or training and learning and development at companies, this is going to be our future quite clearly because the machines are learning this, right? They're learning all of the routines. And yes, these are routines that can be learned. Uh, well, they, they are complicated to be sure, but machines are learning them. And Amazon is automating everything in their warehouses. And that means computers can eventually drive well, not entirely like us, but you know, the goodbye routines is really an important story. But here's the bottom line: the end of routine tasks does not mean the end of human work. It means a different human work. Look at the stat from Amazon that shows how Amazon has automated and at the same time has gained a huge amount of employees for everything else that they're doing. Right? So I think that's quite hopeful to a future if we are prepared and if we have the skills technical skills, uh, human skills, uh, creative skills, uh, the things that machines can't do, human-only work, as I like to call it, right? Because the reality is this, people are thinking, well, you know, if all that automation happens, maybe I become useless. Well, that's far from it. What becomes useless is our routine. Uh, it's the commodity work, the grunt work, the donkey work, whatever you want to call it, that all of us have to do at some point or the other. So whether you're a lawyer doing a non-disclosure agreement or a, a truck driver going a thousand kilometers on the slow lane, just kind of going along in a, in a, in a, in a, in a truck train, as we have already uh, experienced, uh, experienced in, uh, in the US and, and in Bavaria, those jobs can be partly automated. Right? Anything that can be automated will be. That's, that's the rule of digital Darwinism. But the reverse is also true. Right? Anything that cannot be digitized, automated, virtualized, robotized, cognitized, becomes extremely valuable. And that is us. Th those are the skills of our future. Imagination, ethics, empathy, consciousness. Well, that's not a skill, it's a state of being. Right? And c should a computer be conscious, a robot? Well, I think that that's not going to be to our benefit if they are, because that's the opposite. That, that's our spectrum, right? Computers are, are good at things that are hard for us and vice versa, and I think that's going to be our foreseeable future, especially when we talk about artificial intelligence like this, where we see machines who are, that are, uh, well, no, I wouldn't say thinking, calculating and creating patterns and finding new things that we are not able to see, but on top of that, our skills should fare pretty well. And, and this is really the future, is humanity on top of technology. Uh, it's human skills that are accelerated through, through uh, machine skills. So the logic of machines, the calculating power and the processing power, but then our sentience, our existence, you know, our values, our ethics, and some people would say sapiens, right? our wisdom, our learnings, the stuff that we can feel, that we can't prove. Uh, when we put that together, I think we should have a pretty good future on this, but we have to kind of do away with this concept that it's all about efficiency. You know? And this has been the industrial era obsession with you know, profit margin optimization. That's over now because of COVID, right? Now we're saying, well, it's not going to be about efficiency anymore, that much anymore. It's going to be about resilience and adaptation and, ag and agility and reinventing and pivoting. Right? Clearly, we should let go of this concept of... Uh, you know, being the maximum efficient that we can be. And yeah, that's not a human concept. <laughs> you know, this is really a, quite a different story. So when Buckminster Fuller again says, mistakes are great, the more I make, the smarter I get. That is not something that a computer would agree with. And this is really a guiding principle for education. Right? Let's make mistakes. Let's figure out stuff. Let's experiment. Let's not make a deep genius process, you know, pulling the genius out of people when they go to school or when they take our learning and development courses, right? 
removing the genius to download more information. That's a very bad idea. So this future is quite clearly unfolding in front of us. And as we go into this direction, we're seeing, well, you know, a computer could be extremely smart, but uh, data information is not knowledge. It's just data. It's not understanding. It is not wisdom. It's not purpose. It is just data and information. And yes, I put the asterisk behind knowledge because data and information is a kind of a knowledge, right? Uh, kind of an under a kind of it, not a, a version of it that is apart from our own version. So computer knowledge we can certainly use. We don't want computers to have wisdom. <laughs> well, wisdom in terms of numbers, yes. We need to rehumanize what we do in education and in training. We need to uh, look at uh, our vocational training and say, well, really what we need is more human skills because in the end, the ultimate job that we will have is to be human. And maybe it will not be useful for work as we know it today because in 20 years it could well be that we will only have to work in the current sense for two hours a day because the machines do everything else and get paid the same. Right? So rehumanizing education, to, in my view, is crucial Combining the science and the arts, as Steve Jobs has said many times, you know, that is the ticket to our future, combining science and arts. And we're clearly going to see a future where this idea from the Renaissance, you know, how we find our place uh, in the world that we live in, what was called the uh, Vitruvian Man, uh, can be adapted. And I use that now called the Vitruvian, uh, the Neoluvian Man, right, which is essentially about all the technology that's cruising around us. Uh, and, and changing our world to a very large degree, we have to readjust to this. And of course, that's also true if you're a woman, not just if you're a man. And that is going to take a lot of uh, collaboration and also uh, dealing with uncertainty. We live in a world of perpetual VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, and we have to develop new skills to, do, to deal with this. We have to develop new relationships to support us in this process. Uh, I call this a sort of a, a new renaissance, a, a human renaissance. Uh, the importance of being human is going to be much more emphasized in the future. I don't mean being human in the sense of the Anthropocene, you know, everything is about us, nothing else, not that. Uh, it's clearly going to be about people, planet, purpose, and all of that together. But education must lead the way to rehumanize what we do and how we work in the future. Uh, arm in arm with science and technology and engineering and mathematics. So I leave it with a final quote. You know, this is a quote from my book that has become sort of the, uh, the best summary that I have in this book is embrace technology, but don't become technology. I think it applies very much to education, training, learning and development for the future. So thanks very much for tuning in. It's been a great pleasure uh, to speak to you and hopefully with you, and I hope you enjoyed my contributions, and have a good rest of the conference, and thanks very much, and see you down the road. Gerd Leonard, absolutely, we did, didn't we? <laughs> what a great presentation, thanks for the food for thoughts, and what a great presentation in the back, I love it, I have to watch this video twice, for sure. Let's now go on with our daily private sector talk. We would now like to know more about Industry 4.0 and how we organize Education 4.0 for the era of digitalization. And I'm very happy to welcome our guest from Festo, a global industry player for automation technology and for technical education. I am happy to welcome Hans-Jörg Stotz, member of the board of Faster Didactics, joining us from the beautiful city of Esslingen in Germany. Hello, Mr. Stotz. Hello. There he is. Hello. Hello. I take a seat because I have so many things that I'd like to discuss with you. The first question, Mr. Stotz, what is the status quo like? Where are we standing concerning Industry 4.0 in your point of view? I mean, industry for it is around for quite a while. I mean, the, the, the term was coined in 2011. It's almost 10 years next year in spring. At an over fair, we're kind of Henning Kagelmann, uh, Mr. Walster, and Mr. Lukas kind of coined the term. And two years later, in 2013, I think the first papers came out from Akatek looking at the topic. So, in that sense, we're seven years kind of into the business, if you want. And that there has a lot of things happened. At the end of the day, you see an international level, a lot of collaboration, 
um, especially on the topics of technology and standardization. So that topic, I would say we have reached a point where the technologies are known as far as they can be known and are not evolving. But then on the standardization side, there is more and more consensus on the international standardization body, things are coming together. So in that sense, I would say we have come along a long way and we're progressing well. Then if you do a, a slightly step back and you look at what has happened into the industries, I think the reality is that we played around with the technology in first pilots a lot. Now we have a economic crisis where a lot of companies are rethinking, are we continuing the innovation pieces? And realistically, if you really look at uh, the impact that we expect to come from industry for it, though, in terms of innovation and productivity, and this is where I would slightly disagree with kind of the gentleman before me, mm -hmm. in productivity was a topic that we wanted to go for. I think we don't see the full net effect, economic net effect of industry for the dough right now. Okay. And that is, I think, um, partially due to the fact that I think that we have looked at technologies. How do we integrate technologies? We've been coming very much from a, we call it vertical integration perspective. How do we integrate systems technology to the cloud? Mm -hmm. But we have not really kind of worked too much on horizontal integration along business processes. And that is something I think where we can still go a mile and need to go a mile. And in that sense, I think we've progressed well, but we have a bottleneck. And that bottleneck is taking the technology actually broadly out, having enough people with enough skills that can basically take the technology ideas that we have into action and practice it and experiment. Because it's not a clearly defined one-way path where we know how it works. Every company needs to tackle it themselves play with it and then see how their business model evolves, how their technology evolves. So I think skill is the bottleneck. Let's stay at skills. You mentioned it before. Uh, what skills are we talking about in the context of digitalization of Industry 4.0? Well, there is a, there's different sets of skills. I mean, if you really kind of look at the technical side, uh, we know that there is new technology coming in. What we're seeing is um, as different areas are converging IT and OT, so in information technology, operations technology are coming together. We actually have new topics coming in. The entire language and the entire kind of thinking architectures in the software industry has been for a long time foreign to what has been happening on the shop floor. But also in the shop floor, there is significant change happening. If you look into communication technology, network technology, if you look at sensors, for example, they have significantly changed. I mean, the application of in artificial intelligence within uh, a production context. And if you go farther, I mean, robotics, mobile robotics, um, additive manufacturing, there is a lot of new technologies coming into play. And we see that, the, I mean, that's something we can learn probably from the software industry. The software industry was undergoing so much quick, fast change that then the new technologies were coming in, people played around with it and actually figured out they're not working or not working yet and they left it. So a lot of technology coming in what we basically need to tell people. And it's actually a change in, in the professional profiles. We, if you look at how we trained people in the past, I mean, we were we had clear cut separation of the professions. I mean, we had more mechanical uh, professions, we had more electrical and professions, IT professions, and what we see really is like that those professions are converging, and that means that there is basically a spillover between the professions, and people basically need to adapt and look left and right and learn new stuff. Mm -hmm. There is another thing which I think we need to learn from or could learn from the IT industry. There is a concept called T-shaped profiles. T because I think there is kind of like the depth expertise and then there is kind of the connectivity to others. Innovation as we would like to see in an industry for though, is something that you do in teams, that you do together. And then you have different skill sets. You have designers, you have IT people in there, mechanics people in there. And as a, as a team, you basically need to evolve this. So you need to be able to talk the same language. A lot of the skills are not necessarily technical skills, they're social skills. Understanding, listening, having the same opinion, actually making mistakes. It's hard for engineers to make mistakes. 
you're not actually learning to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. you're, it's, it's actually good if you don't make mistakes. So how do you get into an innovation culture that quickly iterates, explores something which is not really ready and throws it away? And that is new. And in that sense, I think we just don't only need the technical skills, mastering the new technologies. More important thing even is how do we work together? How do we innovate methodologies like Scrum are out there, agile development methodologies, design thinking as a way to be more customer or user centric are things that are coming big time. Mr. Stotz, from your point of view, um, how shall we address the skill gap that exists without a doubt? I mean, the, the, if, you, if you really look out there and you want to get the skill onto the shop floor, into the factory, into engineering to make the difference and, and get the benefits from industry for it though, you need to train a lot of people. So what we are doing right now is we have changed predominantly in the dual education system in Germany, but more in the, in the formal education system for first time education, we have started to adapt um, the content that we train there. I can talk for Germany as an example, but a lot of the stuff that happened in Germany is going to be shared with the rest of the world and the community. There is the, 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 the adaptation of the job profiles, the curricula. Mm -hmm. And that is there for first time education. But now if you look at that the numbers of people that we hire as trainees, apprentices is actually going down in the crisis. If there is a shift away from mechanics, mechatronics to electronics and IT technologies, we will have a scarcity in those jobs that bring the latest technology to the shop floor. So the, the tricky thing is really that everything that we have in those new curricula needs to be taken over to people on the shop floor, people who have been trained like five, 10 years ago. And this is, I think, where we need to look and see how can we take the learnings from kind of vocational education, vocational training, and basically take them over and take them over into continuing education. Mm -hmm. The separation of continuing education, first-time education, from, from our perspective at Festo Didactic, I think is outdated. The, the investments that have been made significantly into the training of first-time education need to be leveraged for continuing education. And if you look at countries, for example, like the Netherlands, where you see at certain colleges already kind of that professional students, vocational students are being trained together on a project basis, you can sense that I think we need to start rethinking the way how we deploy the resources that we already have. Thank you. There was a crack in the line. Can I hear you still? Maybe we can check that. Is it I working? Can hear, perfect. I can perfect. Hear you. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Schatz. Um, you just mentioned the learning from vocational training. Can we dive a bit deeper into this topic? How can that look like? I mean, I think vocational training that, that we do right now is we, we have the classical mechatronics, mechanics, electrical engineering profiles, and they have changed. If you look, for example, we have a profile electronic for automation technology. If you look into the internal mechanics of the curriculum, a lot of IT has moved in there. Information about big data, how you use sensor data, how you connect to networks, and there's a lot of good stuff happening there. What you need to do is it's not just learning theory. It's not just reading books and texts. What you need to change there is how can people play around with that technology? So in a non-disruptive way, you can't do that on the shop floor. You basically need to have a physical learning environment that helps you to experiment with those new technologies and play with them. But at the same time, you provide students a flexible way of consuming the theoretical knowledge. That's what we see right now. Okay. Mr. Schatz, maybe a simple, short question, but maybe not so easy uh, to answer. How does learning change in the future? Uh, that, that, I mean, we're discussing it a lot with kind of our own students. So at Festo Didactic, we're also training all the vocational students at Festo as the, as the group. Uh, but we're working a lot, of course, with our customers and, and, and discuss with teachers and students. So, I mean, learning as we all learned it or uh, as we all went through it was a very teacher oriented exercise mm -hmm. i mean there was someone who was the authority who told us what to do and basically graded us and told us good guy bad guy performed well or not mm -hmm. now if, if if the subject itself becomes a little bit more uncertain 
And if you kind of have so much distraction for the younger generation out there to do interesting stuff somewhere else, you need to make learning interesting. Mm. If, you, if you listen carefully to the World Economic Forum, for example, and there are discussions about the skill gap, how hard it is for manufacturing companies to attract people to be interesting to the young generation, mm. you need to create excitement. You need to make it fun. You need, to be, you need to be meaningful for people to explore. And that changes that relationship between the learner and the teacher. Mm -hmm. The teacher becomes more a coach. He's helping people where to go and how to learn because he cannot always be the expert. Stuff is changing so quickly and sometimes the students knows more. That needs to redefine kind of the relationship. And the other thing is the classical classroom training where you sit there and you know you have like in the next four weeks you're learning X and then week for week, hour for hour, when we talk to students, they want to be more independent, autonomous. They want to decide when they learn, where they learn, how they learn. They want to use mobile learning. And in times of COVID, I mean, for them, this is, this is where they are. And they, they, they said it already a year ago. Well, we want try. to be more flexible. Yes, uh -huh. they want to, at, at home in bed, that's where they want to learn, mm -hmm. using their mobile phone really? while they game. And it's a, it's a different way. But when you learn technology, you need a physical system. So yeah. we need to combine going to the physical system, exploring that with digital experiences. And that's, I think, where learning goes. And that's even more important if we look at continuing education. I think continuing education, you and I as professionals, everybody in the audience, if they think how they learn, they don't learn by being sent to a class for a week and then come back. I mean, we all know it's the travel cost and we're trying to save on travel costs. People are away, you can reach them, you don't have a substitute. That's not how we train people. We train people by giving them the, the possibility within the context of their work to explore, to test new things and, and yeah, apply it and dismiss it at the same time. So we need the, those digital elements that we were talking about, how the kids would like to learn, actually are true the same way for professionals. You want to learn on the sofa or in the, on the train back home. Mm. You want to use the time in between, which is idle time to learn. Mm. And then you need to go to the equipment in a non-disruptive way where you're not disturbing the business, but where it's very close to the business, where it looks like same components, the same technologies, but in a risk-free environment. That's how we envision learning to be in the times of digital. And you see a lot of things like gaming, virtual reality, augmented reality starting to evolve where people play with the idea, couldn't we learn in a gaming situation? I mean, is a World of Warcraft, Call of Duty, whatever. Fortnite That's what's fun is, for the young generation. Yeah? Exactly. <laughs> is that the environment in which you could also learn mechatronics? Uh -huh. That's, I think, an interesting question. A very good idea. I think uh, the students would be happy if it comes, as you said. <laughs> Thank you. What potential does Industry 4.0 offer, in your opinion, for a sustainable growth? I think the... <sighs> The, the, when we talk about the learning aspect of industry for it, though, and sustainability, I think the question is how you tackle sustainability. Sustainability has a lot of connotations. I mean, there is the sustainability connotation of sustainable growth in terms of continuing growth. I mean, the initial point was when, when industry for it though, was brought in that we have the need to respond to consumer demand. Uh, the consumerization uh, of the businesses meant that we have very particular ideas what type of product we wanted, we wanted fast. So industry for the dough actually gives back that competitive advantage and you can build in a flexible way, individualized lot size one products. So that's sustainable in the sense of continuing growth because otherwise you're at risk. Mm. But when we talk about sustainable, we very often mean environmentally sustainable. And environmentally sustainable, I think a lot of topics being discussed in Industry 4.0 right now, in the platform Industry 4.0, for example, are around energy efficiency, CO2 neutrality. And a lot of content that we are training in our curricula, for example, when we build a large curriculum for Industry 4.0 for the vocational schools, the core element in there is how do you basically sense with sensors the energy consumption of a machine? How can you use big data to look at that kind of information? How could you optimize the energy consumption of a machine? And that is a very important topic. So we need to create awareness in students when they learn for the first time 
what they can do with technology to drive sustainability. That's the second aspect. And the third aspect, I think sustainable, sustainable in the sense of investing in people. I think industry 4.0 is, as I said earlier, the constant change of technology, the constant change of business models and the permanent adaptations of the workforce to the skills needed. So employability is, a, is something about sustainability. We, we create equal chances, we, we create fairness that people can learn digitally, update themselves and basically play a meaningful role in the context of work. And I think there, this is the most important third aspect. We want to help learners to be successful in that lifelong journey of adapting to technology changes. And I think in that sense, sustainability is mostly about people from my perspective. Mr. Stotz, thank you so much. I just got the information from our technic team that we have technical problems with the sound on our uh, YouTube channel. Mr. Stotz, please stay there. I have some more questions for you. Uh, we will fix that. Uh, we have the best technic team ever here. So they are running all around there trying to fix this problem. So please stay there, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to fix that and we uh, show you a video from uh, Danny Gauch and we'll be back in some seconds, hopefully. Stay there. Hello, my name is Danny Gauch and I'm the Director General of the World Dadaq Association. World Dadaq is about connecting organizations, companies and experts with the intention to encourage dialogue, partnership and initiatives so as to advance education development and promote innovation. We want to contribute toward improvement of education in all fields and all levels. It's our intention to become the place to go for anyone who has any question with regard to education. We may not directly have the answer, but we are very happy to help you look so that the next time the same question arises, we'll already know it. We look to interact with all stakeholders throughout the education supply chain. And therefore, we encourage companies who value business integrity and ethics, as well as wanting to have a positive impact on education to join us. We encourage teachers, educators, and institution heads to sign up for our different newsletters, which are events, members marketplace, and e-flashes as well as to follow us on social media to receive updates on innovations and to interact with our members and affiliates at events. You can find us also on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We encourage national and regional associations who are dedicated to education to affiliate themselves with World Dadak so that the know-how is transferred globally. We encourage NGOs, GEOs, multinational banks, etc to include World Dadak in the planning phases of education projects in order to identify different potential solutions at an early stage. If you'd like to know more about World Dadak and see where you can fit in, please don't hesitate to contact us. The team and I are happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much for your time in listening to my message. Ladies and gentlemen, sorry for the short break due to technical problems. We are there in some seconds. Please take a breath and stay there. Uh, we go on in some seconds. Oh, just got the information that I can go on. Is that right? So, thumbs up from the best team ever. Thanks to everybody helping to fix uh, this problem. And a big sorry also to you, Mr. Stutz, uh, for this break. No we, problem. we just wanted to prove that this is a live event and no video recording. <laughs> it's good, it's good. I, did, I didn't prove it with my collapsing uh, in the land here, so it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> sorry also to our guests here live in Baird. But some more good questions, hopefully, uh, Mr. Stutz. Um, what would you say, what are the key issues if a company thinks about focusing on digital learning? What would you say, in your opinion? What should a company do? I mean, we are still very traditional when it comes to learning. I mean, learning for us, uh, is very often still employee triggered. I would like to learn. 
or in the best case, manager triggered, you should learn, which kind of sounds like a threat. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in very few cases, we have a strategic workforce planning where we really do know where we want to go. I think to, at the end of the day, this is a senior management topic to understand what skill set do we need to kind of gradually shift business models somewhere else. And that needs to trickle down into the organization. And I think the most important thing there is we have a hard time, as I said earlier, sending people out for a week to learn something on Excel and then come back and then they're here. What you would like to see is that the learning is embedded in the daily work. And I, th I think good learning companies who work with the 70-20-10 model where 70% is on the job and informal learning, I think there, I think it is important that you basically change your learning culture. Let's have a look into the future, Mr. Stotz. How does the trend look like? Are there some trends that you can see uh, regarding the Industry 4.0 development? I mean, in, uh, if you're not looking at the technical side, what's going to happen there, but if you're more looking at the learning side of Industry 4.0, I would foresee that we get smaller types of curricula that you can easily recombine and connect we see that the different countries like in North America, Middle America or China have different expectations, different needs, like in Central Europe where learning is more form formalized. So we need to have smaller learning chunks, nuggets as we call them, that you can recombine. The learning itself will change that the teacher will be more the person who configures individualized learning for people. And people actually, by leaving traces and how they learn, will get recommendations how to what to learn next and how to learn it. Things like video or gamification will play a bigger role to create a better engagement level. And I, I would say that a lot of the physical equipment we're seeing right now, and that you can see in COVID, is gradually augmented, not replaced, augmented by virtual training environments, where we're looking at things like a digital twin how would you learn with a digital twin, combine a digital twin with simulation? You, you use things like AR, augmented reality, in, for example, maintenance jobs, where you train people by showing them this is how you decompose a certain component. So those elements that create a more combination of theoretical, theoretical stuff and bringing it to the physical equipment, those are things that we foresee and where we were kind of excited to work on. So it's becoming a very much a, a digital learning experience that needs to help you based on a environment where you as my teacher and I as your student can exchange. You basically help me to learn at my pace. You assign me certain tasks. And it's not that I'm feeling stupid in the classroom because I don't understand while others kind of have a big airtime there. But you can assign me things that I do in my speed. I have choice. And I think that will change learning significantly. Mr. Stolz, Education 4.0, a topic we could talk on and on. Time is running. We're already at the end of our talk. Thanks so much for your insights. Thanks so much for being part at Future Talk 2020. Um, and goodbye to my home country, to Germany. Thank you, Mr. Stolz from Festo Didactic. Thanks for having me and have a great, uh, great event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. This is your Bye. applause. Ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with our first panel for today. I'm looking forward. This topic is also very exciting. How does digital education and artificial intelligence impact economies? How does it impact societies? And how does it impact our life? And what does Work 4.0 look like during the 2020 years? Wow, I'm happy to introduce our panelists. And one is already there live in Bern, I say, Hello to Michel Mitura, Head of HR for Headquarters at Schindler Aufzüge AG. Hello and thank you for Hello being here. Hello everybody, <laughs> thanks for the invitation. And our other panelists are joining us via video call. And here they are, I say hi to Jan Mischke, partner at McKinsey Global Institute, MGI. Thanks for having me. Hello, Mr. Mischke. Also Sergio Faske, Head of Education at Nokia Corporation. Hello, nice to meet you. And Mark Vontobel, founder and CEO at StarMind. Hello, gentlemen. Hello, thanks for having me. 
So what an interesting topic we'd like to focus on in the next 45 of 50 minutes. I just dive into the uh, topic um, and have the first question um, for Jan Mischke. Mr. Mischke, you are the partner at McKinsey Global Institute, uh, MGI, which is a business and uh, economics research arm of McKinsey. So you do dive deep on how digitalization could accelerate business and ultimately also society for sure. So now in those challenging new normal, we call it like this, could you please uh, share your thoughts? How will COVID-19 impact the path of digitization, AI, and also the economic growth? Yes, so we, we actually see that, that digitization is, is really on steroids now since the outbreak of the pandemic. So it, it, it might even in, in, in the context of this really bad crisis be a little bit of the silver lining on the on the horizon um, where businesses are, are really accelerating their investments into digital technologies they're accelerating their digital transformations which things that used to take years and years of, of change management are essentially happening overnight and no one actually doubts that it's needed and everyone just learns what what needs to be learned because they have to um, and um, channels are shifting to digital, retailers are shifting online, uh, but also in, in, in other sectors. If you look at uh, maybe a sector that isn't the first one coming to mind for digitization, construction, um, you see how firms are really accelerating now the adoption of building integration modeling of digitally supported lean construction software on site to facilitate smoother uh, site logistics, planning and management of their staff on site, and also shifting more construction or formerly construction works to uh, off-site prefabrication plants that with industry 4.0 technologies that can now actually um, produce the right things that they need. So there's, there's this huge transition now that has been going on for a while that is accelerating now because of the crisis. Um, and we could actually see that there is a potential to reach some two to 4% productivity growth over the next decade. Uh, which would be about well, more than double the rate we've seen over the last decade um, because of this, this crisis-induced acceleration. There is a big risk, though, and, and, and I'm happy to go uh, into that in, in more detail, that that very digitalization will also accelerate automation of jobs and this way actually depress incomes, depress consumption, and also depress investments. So we might be uh, up for sustained weaknesses in demand that could counteract the very productivity gains in the first place. Thanks, Mr. Mischke. Ladies and gentlemen, to our panelists, we want an interactive panel here. So even if we're not here all together live in this uh, event hall, please, if you want to add something to a statement from the other panelists, do so. We're happy about that. So um, I will go on with uh, Mr. Faske. You're the head of learning um, and development at Nokia, a Finnish uh, company in the field of multinational telecommunications and information technology. So digitalization is on your agenda, we could say. Could you tell us what changes have you seen in your business as a result of COVID-19? Would that uh, changes have happened anyways? Um, and do you think that you will return to the normal of the past? Very nice question. Um, we in Nokia, we are, in my view, in a, in a privileged position uh, to see all what is ongoing because uh, now, as never before, it's clear that the communication platform is essential. This, this uh, conference could not have happened without uh, a strong communication platform and network. Probably uh, some years ago, we would have just cancelled and lost the opportunity to learn from each other, to debate about the future, and to take advantage of these connections. So this is, in my view, the first lesson learned. A uh, highly reliable and uh, scalable network are essential. The communities continue to operate, the business continue to go ahead, our children continue to learn because there is this infrastructure that is essential. And I'm not telling this because of Nokia, I'm telling this because I think it's really a sort of basis that, that, that is important. If you look at some numbers, um, in the first week after the start of the pandemic, at least in the Western countries, we have seen a growth of the network traffic by 50% in one week. 
you can imagine 50% boom grow of the traffic and the network continue to work. And now after six months, we still see a growth of 30% of the traffic compared with the year before. Mm -hmm. So it's massive and is and is very important. Mm, I, I believe that this is uh, also that has also highlighted the importance to take care of the digital divide. Because uh, it's true that uh, uh, we have uh, fantastic networks, it's true that we have fantastic solutions, and we have been able to be all connected as families, as companies, as communities, but still there are people that are not yet in this, uh, let's say, privileged world in some way. And this is very important looking forward, especially for education. Now, if I look uh, at uh, the learning side, uh, we work, uh, we are a company that is a Finnish company, and so we have embedded in our culture, the culture of learning, the, the, the clear picture that knowledge of our people, skills of our people, is the real key success factor. The Mr. Ambassador said clearly before, Finland is a small company, but has been able to be successful because of this great connection between education, technology, and innovation. And, uh, and what we have seen is uh, a, a shift towards digital learning. Uh, we were delivering our uh, um, learning solution to our employee and to our customers. Uh, I would say before the COVID, something like 60% uh, was uh, virtual, virtual in the sense of virtual instructor led or online. Now is 96%. So a fantastic and, and incredible uh, shift. But I don't believe this will be the status quo after the pandemic. I think after the pandemic, we will go more in a, a, a sort of mix of situation. I don't believe too that we will be back as pre-COVID. Mm. I think we will have a good mix between uh, in-person activity because also social relation and, 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 and contact is important, but also uh, a big part will be uh, still digital. And this will open, in my view, great opportunities for all the individuals because I truly believe that uh, the, the, your skill development is your own responsibility as an individual, because this makes you important, uh, relevant in the job market, for example. This helps uh, your company to succeed on the business and help your community to be relevant uh, and to be uh, at the front, front edge. So uh, in short, I think we will not be back as before, we will not be as today. We probably will be in a form that is more blended, mm -hmm. but for sure, digital part would be essential. Exciting future to come. Thank you very much, Mr. Faske. Uh, Mrs. Mitura, your yes. head of HR development from uh, Schindler, I think Switzerland. Mark has a comment. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I think Mark was sorry, trying uh, to add a comment. <laughs> you, he wanted to add yes, something. No, Miss Vitura, so sorry. I, I, yes, please, Marco, add something. Sure. No worries, no worries. I fully agree with what, what Sergio said, and I believe the, uh, a very important topic is connectivity, but I believe it's also a trap. Uh, I believe in the digital age, or in, in, in this digital world, we start being connected 24-7, but we are connected with the same people over and over again. So we, we, we have more channels to use. We have Zoom, we have Slack, we have Teams yeah. and so on. But we talk to the same people over and over again. And there is a, a very interesting article uh, from the Harvard Business uh, Review uh, that came out uh, a few weeks ago that uh, the, co uh, like the collaboration within your direct team actually increased by 40%. You have many more interactions with those people you already Oh, there is something wrong. He just stopped moving and now we can't hear anything. Um, so also we have to fix this. Mark Vontobel, maybe we try to reconnect um, I just have a look what my team says. We go on with the next question and hopefully uh, get Mr. Vontobel back for repeating this answer, for example. Um, so, 
Mrs. Mitura, once more. Uh, you're the head of HR development from uh, Schindler Switzerland, a global company for elevators and moving walks. And for sure, all of us have used your elevators and moving walks in the past, your excellent ones. Um, I would like to know, um, Mrs. Mitura, how do you manage the digital transformation we're all in um, at Schindler Group? Uh, we started this journey quite some time ago with modern tools for our employees. It shows in the numbers of a recent survey where 95% said, yes, we can do it. We can work from home immediately, pushed by the COVID situation. Mm -hmm. People were prepared to do that from one day to the other. Um, we also moved so quickly from emails to MS Teams. Mm -hmm. The whole situation pushed us out of our comfort zones. Mm -hmm. Another example are our fitters and service technicians, so the, the guys who actually install the elevators and maintain the elevators. Many, many years ago, they had like big folders carrying around, and since about 10 years, they got smartphones uh, with an app on it called FieldWiki. On there, they have all the technical documentation, customer information, internal company infos at their fingertip. So new releases are available immediately to them. In the future, we could go further for digital transformation. So continue to work across organizations, departments, hierarchy levels. We call this collaboration. It's a combination of open collaboration and positive action. action uh -huh. So for example, we started to use more agile methods such as Kanban, Scrum, and one important part of our people strategy in Schindler, Switzerland is that we want to elevate culture. Mm -hmm. We want to uh, empower people more. We want to have less hierarchy. Um, we want to be more agile. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Mitura for this insight. I have some more questions, but I just heard also that uh, Mark is there. It is working again. I'm back. I actually I'm back. <laughs> I left talking about connectivity. So yes, please go on. I I'm thrilled of the great office you're at. I want to be there too. It looks so actually, futuristic. That's a virtual background. It uh, is? It's, it's a virtual background, but it's, it is, yeah, but it's our, uh, it's, it's a, a picture of our actual office in, in Zurich. Uh, then, but then, then that's okay. I'm in, in the basement here uh, at home, in quarantine, actually. Oh, no. <laughs> so please yes. go no, on, so please go I'm on, not, I'll repeat it, thanks. Yes, so, so I believe what, 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 what this uh, hyper-connectivity, this 24-7 being connected to the internet and so on, actually, makes with us, it, it makes us believe that we're actually connected, but we're reducing our contacts to those we already know. We don't stumble into people anymore at the, uh, at the coffee machine. We don't build these weak links anymore in, uh, in, 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 in the company itself. So we, we are more connected, uh, like on a, technical, uh, on a technical level, but we are way less connected on a human level, and that's uh, what, what, what came to my mind when, when, when uh, Sergio was talking about connectivity, and I think that's something we really have to be careful about. Mm. Thanks, Mars. Let's uh, stay at, at your um, yeah, insights we want to hear. Um, you're CEO from StarMind. Um, you're what we call a typical startup entrepreneur. Um, your company develops artificial intelligence platforms with the goal to unlock collective intelligence and enterprise, or even more, uh, to enable organizations for three goals. Identify experts, access to know-how, and solve skill gaps. Um, so can you please explain us what the impact of augmenting is rather than replacing human knowledge? Maybe that now sounds a little bit strange from someone who, who works in artificial intelligence, but I think the most important thing is to, that we have to demystify artificial intelligence because we are so far away from, from building anything that is close to human intelligence uh, that we shouldn't be scared of what's going on there. But as the, the, the speaker before said, computers are especially good in doing routine tasks, in doing analysis, in doing calculation, things that we are not too good at. 
And I think if you bring both worlds together, you create like a superpower. Uh, and that should be in the end the goal. And that uh, will have a huge impact. Thanks, Mark. For all just uh, seeing that I'm using my iPhone here, I'm <laughs> not chatting. I want you, ladies and gentlemen, to be interactive with us. So if you want to be part of our panel, please send me your questions during the common function on YouTube or through our event app, Whova. Um, the questions will receive, I will receive your questions here on my um, phone to hand them over to our panelists. So if I can see something, I hand it over to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Mischke, another question. How could AI and digitalization impact education from your point of view? Yeah, the the, the opportunities are obviously in bun, abundant, and I think all of us uh, and everyone who has, has young chickens uh, and has lived on this planet over the last year or so has ample experiences uh, with digital technologies and education. Um, so I think the, 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 the impact can be, uh, can be huge in terms of new education formats, but also particularly in terms of uh, AI-supported educational software, the likes of uh, the tools by Khan Academy or plenty of other software tools that, that essentially assess where, where a kid stands in its development journey and, and then develops the right learning journey ahead, or develops uh, points to the right questions and so on. So I think there can be huge progress um, coming out of this crisis. What I'm a bit surprised by is that when I, when I look around, I, I don't see much of that happening. It seems to be more like we have closed the school system, we innovated hugely, uh, now we have opened it by, uh, again and threw away all the innovations we had in the meantime. So I'm currently slightly um, frustrated. Okay. Um, Marco, you're just nodding, agreeing on what he said. No, no, I, if I can comment what, what uh, Jan was saying, uh, just to add is, uh, I also think that we see a lot of uh, remote teaching more than really a digital enabled learning. And these are very different things. Uh, 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 this is why, at least I, I, I talk for my country where I, where I live, that is uh, uh, Italy. Um, uh, there was a, a lot of good intent, but I don't believe that uh, uh, many of the teachers uh, are uh, trained. They have the skills to be engaging, to be uh, really impactful through the digital media. And this is a problem that we need to solve um, in the future. Otherwise, I agree with you, and we, we tend to come back to the comfort zone. No? We come back to the usual stuff uh, instead to evolve. That, uh, in my view, is, is the future. Sergio, one more question that I'd like to hand over to you. What does the convergence of technology and education mean not only for business, but for entire societies? Um, you know, we, we are, at least from my perspective, we are in the middle of two transformations. No? One was the transformation coming with the introduction of 5G that uh, is not just more bandwidth than before, so I can download my film faster or play better on, 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 uh, on a game, but it's really to have a, a, an ultra broadband network with very low latency capabilities and super reliable that can, enab can enable new things. Uh, today, a lot of what we do online is, let's say, the copy paste of what we were doing before in person. We buy online, but, is it, but this, with this new technology, we really open opportunities that in my view, we cannot even imagine today. And this will be very fast. Mm -hmm. So what I want to say is that uh, many people are, they are fear of this transformation. And, and, and as, as any transformation will bring uh, new opportunities, many new opportunities, but will bring also some, uh, I would say, um, impact uh, on uh, other jobs. Uh, and for me, it will be key. And, and this push to, to have a more, uh, an education that is more easy to have available for many people around the globe, it will have to close the bridge. Because um, we need to realize that the transformation will be faster as never before. Mm. 
And so this problem and education is not as fast as the transformation. It takes time to, to be able to help the people to have the right skills, the right competencies, um, to use the artificial intelligence as Marco was saying before. And I agree, we need to demystify artificial intelligence. Probably is the name in some way that is misleading. Mm. Artificial intelligence is an help for us as human beings to perform better and, and, and to avoid the tasks that well, they are not really good tasks for us. It, it, there is a lot of education that is needed. There is a lot of skills that need to be spread. There is a lot of uh, uh, transformation in the skills of the people that we need to do. We can do, but there, in my view, it will be critical, the collaboration between public and private. I'm not talking too much about companies like McKinsey, Nokia, and so on. They will invest, uh, or, or Shindra, they will invest, they will have their plan, they will have money to do it. Mm. But if we look a bit more at a social point of view, mm. at the community level point of view, this is something that will need, in my view, a strong, tight collaboration between the two sides of the coin, the public and the private, to take advantage of this industry revolution and not to have this as a problem. Thanks, Sergio. Michel, what new skills are required in the future, in your opinion, and what do you do at Schindler um, to help the employees in that case? With new technologies, with more digital, with more robotics, it will be very important for us to create an open mindset. Mm. So people have to be ready, open, especially the older generation. People development is one of our five core values, and we integrate new findings into our learning programs. For example, always ensuring we apply 70-20-10. We heard that before today. Mm. So 70% is um, on the job learning, 20% is um, learning by others, and 10% only is formal training. So we also started to mix our methods. We have much more e-learning nowadays, much more video tutorials, and less and less um, classroom trainings. Mm -hmm. I think as a balance to all these digital things, yeah. <laughs> social skills will be even more important mm -hmm. in the future. Uh, it will be about adapting fast, learning continuously, search for information, networking. We want to provide platforms for generations to um, exchange, kind of reverse mentoring, so the experienced people can teach the younger ones, the young generations, but the young generations will um, mentor the older generation about the digital tools. Mm -hmm. Again, also for these new skills, collaboration will be important. So we exchange, no, nobody is um, the expert anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to work together to be able to, to meet the future requirements. So, so we can learn, action again. learn from each other, yes. the younger and the older. Good. This is one part of it, yes. A good, good plan. Thanks, um, Michelle. Mark, another question that I'd like to hand over um, to you. Why is it so crucial to capture the collective knowledge of N or your organization as part of the new way of work? Well, we, we often talk about skill gaps, right? And, and we talk that we have to reskill and upskill people, uh, but we tend to forget that a lot of the skills and the, the capabilities are actually present in many organizations, but they're somewhere hidden, hidden in, 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 in silos, hidden in hierarchical silos, in, in cultural silos, in, in organizational silos, geographical silos, uh, but they are there. And without actually uncovering them, we, we miss great opportunities. And for example, just uh, as, 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 as an example from the real world, uh, a lot of people uh, say that uh, Kodak uh, disappeared because they didn't have the knowledge to disrupt themselves or they didn't do good at uh, digital transformation. But actually Kodak held patents on digital photography. They did have the true experts within the company but the knowledge was hidden the knowledge was hidden behind those silos and i believe it's it's really important and that's why i come back to connectivity 
to uncover these capabilities, to uncover who has what kind of skills and connect people based on what they know, based on, on, on what their true skills and uh, intelligence actually is. And then I believe you can really transform. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Jan, uh, what is, in your opinion, the role of digital skill building for economic growth? Yeah, I think we already heard uh, about the importance of, of digital skills, but also fi finding the digital skills. But, but, but I think in addition to finding them, we, we also need more. Um, we did an, an analysis for Switzerland, for instance, uh, where we expect that uh, 10 years from now, um, we will need 100 or the equivalent of 100,000 more full-time equivalents with, uh, with advanced technical skills. Uh, we also need similar amount uh, or kind of uh, numbers or amounts of skills in social and economic, uh, social and, 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 and emotional skills. So agree on that front, but also, also the technical skills. Um, and, and currently those skills pipelines are not met. So we, we for instance, also in Switzerland talked to 100 CEOs to, to understand why fewer multinational companies are coming to the country. And the lack of access to digital talent was, was one of the foremost reasons uh, for that respective slowdown. Um, but also more broadly, essentially, if we, if we can't meet those skill needs, if we can't fill the talent pipelines and, and, and build the respective skills, then much of the digital transformation that allows faster growth, better productivity, and so on will, will just not happen or just not happen as fast and, and slow down growth. And I, I, I might even make a bit of a provocative statement um, and, and even link the, uh, the lack in digital skills that we have to the negative interest rates. And, and, and here's why. People complain, oh, we are negative interest rates, it's all the central banks and so on. But the, the, the reality is the fundamental mass is that we have high savings because of aging demographics and ever declining investments over the last 20 years. So why do we have ever declining investments? To an extent, of course, that's aging, macroeconomic outlook, all kinds of reasons. But it's also because we are transitioning from building those new large format retail stores like um, Walmart from building large motorways or railroads or whatever it is with lots of arms and legs to, to dig holes. We are moving into investing into software technology, AI, digital processes and so on where we need those skills. And those investments are not happening as fast as companies would like to make them because they don't have those skills. So invested, investment is actually short and down because of skill gaps and um, that has those kind of macroeconomic implications. Yeah, and I just received an interesting question here. Um, from your point of view, where do we currently stand in the transition of Industry 4.0 in the companies? I think there's a, there, there, there's a huge spread uh, where there's a couple of, of companies uh, who are also re well recognized at light, Lighthouse examples and so on that are working side by side with the respective technology suppliers, uh, but also consultancies and so on to really go all in in industry 4.0, uh, equipped factories and the like, uh, dark factories where there's literally no single human anymore. Um, so the kind of really the spare of that, um, but there's also a long tail uh, and that's of course the bulk of, of, of companies and economic activities who are just starting to hear the word. Thank you. Sergio, uh, why do you believe the fourth industrial revolution will have more profound economic and so societal impact than its predecessor? Oh, we can't hear you. Your Sorry, I was in mute. Off. I was in mute. <laughs> I was talking in mute. Um, uh, we, um, as I said before, uh, um, in the last 20 years, uh, there was a uh, I would say a first step of digitalization that was uh, reproducing in digital services that were available in other form. Um, we change the way how we buy, we change uh, the way how we read the books, we change the way how we uh, consume uh, films or video or media or whatever, the social media. But uh, this was, uh, in my view, not a uh, a really game changer. It was a bit more a transformation of services from one way to another, but still more or less similar. Uh, now with the 5G, 
I think that uh, uh, there, there will be a more uh, drastic change uh, in, in what we do. Um, there will be, um, really, this platform enable uh, the possibility to create services that today, I, I truly believe we cannot even image. Uh, we can exchange mass of data, but we can also have uh, uh, services that interact in very few milliseconds across the globe. You can imagine that a person, a, a, a surgery in, in Italy can play a surgery, I don't know, in, in Alaska. And, and, and this can be real time because the latency between the two is negligible and the reliability of the network is, is fantastic. So this is just to make an example. Now, in this, in this transformation, I repeat myself probably, I already said a couple of times, but the role of education, the role of knowledge, the role of skills, it will be terrific. And, and I agree with what Mark said before. In, in, in Nokia, we as a, a sort of slogan we use that we say that the skills are the currency of the future. Uh, that at the end means that uh, all around, that all is around skills and competencies. And this is valid for a company like Nokia, but I can assume for the other companies. But I repeat, it's valid for the individuals. And, 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 and in my view, uh, the social responsibility of the different countries uh, is really to make sure that the possibility to have the right skills is is, is broader and spread across the people so that we will not leave too many people behind. Uh, otherwise, the risk is that we will have fantastic jobs uh, for people, but we will miss experts uh, or people working in that area, and we will leave people behind with a big social problem. And this is something, in my view, that uh, collectively, industries, governments, people, we need to focus on. And the speed is I repeat, unprecedented. The speed is something that we have never experienced before. And COVID is even accelerating. So this is, in my view, the challenge. And the challenge is to take advantage of it for a better, let's say, lifestyle, for the better well-being of the people, or to have a big problem. And, and, and this will be determined about how good we are in managing it collectively. Thanks, uh, Sergio. Michelle, let's talk about your, your front staff, for example, the fitters and uh, the service technicians. How has the onboarding and the training changed foremost in the last eight months of uh, COVID-19? Yeah. Let me put on that just to make the point <laughs> who I'm talking about. So we talk about our fitters and service technicians. <laughs> So the, the people in the field, uh, it, it's not specifically the last eight months which changed. Um, in Switzerland, we have a so-called lift camp. So this is um, an education. It takes um, two months where newly hired fitters and service technicians um, come in and they learn practically and theoretically how to install and how to maintain a, li a lift. Um, and in between, they had like a three weeks uh, practical session in the field, applying what they learned. The first bigger change came around two years ago, where we really started to mix the methods. Uh, so um, they got much more e-learnings, uh, around 27, and around 50 to 70 video tutorials. Mm -hmm. So now they watch a video how to install something. Mm -hmm. It's uh, much easier also language wise. Mm -hmm. um, not everybody is fluent in German or we have uh, three languages in Switzerland. And also they can actually watch it when they use it. And repeat it, and watch repeat it, it once, twice, th exactly. three times. Or mm -hmm. they have now um, learning methods. So watching, listening, practical applying, which um, makes it much more successful. Very interesting. Thank you. Okay. Mark, the companies are now forced to transform very quickly. Everything has to be a bit faster. How does AI simplify this digital transformation from your point of view? Well, I believe uh, there is a lot of untapped potential within uh, every company in terms of data that is all already there and in terms of people that are there 
and I talked before about the knowledge that is hidden somewhere in a silo, uh, the same thing happens for a lot of uh, data points that would actually give you insights into who knows what, who has what kind of skills. So people are using uh, tons of different applications on a daily basis, leave a lot of traces, not confidential traces, but really uh, show actually to the company what they know, what, what, what their intelligence, what their capabilities are. And AI is, is the only way to actually make sense out of that data at scale, to really figure out who has what kind of skills, to draw the conclusions based on the data you have, based on the, the billions of data points that every large organization has stored in different clouds and applications and so on. And AI is actually ready to, to, to draw those conclusions and can uh, accelerate any digital transformation uh, tremendously. I just received an interesting question through our Whova app. And uh, Mark, as you are a startup unlocking the collective intelligence, I want to hand, hand it over to you. What should data culture look like is the question. Well, in the end, uh, there is, uh, I believe, a, a very good uh, regulation in place that actually gives a lot of power to the user or to the employee. I believe data in the end should be owned by those that produce it. Uh, but still, a, a lot of value is inside the data if you look at it, connect it, connect the dots uh, and with, with uh, the consent uh, of the user because you create value for the user itself because an employee gets found uh, for, for the true skills and so on. Uh, there is no reason why not to use that data. But in the end, I truly believe that the data should be owned by the person uh, who creates it. Thank you. Um, so let's check what we have to discuss. Um, I had this one, I had this one. There is one on my phone. I saw it. <laughs> so I will hand that over. Um, there is another question. What is the role of digital skill building for economic growth? You see, I have a, a tablet, a phone here, so I'm a bit confused which question <laughs> to pose uh, first. So what is the role of digital skill building for economic growth? I don't know who wants to answer it. Gentlemen, who's first? <laughs> it's from our audience. Nobody. Jan. I, th I think I already had a bite at it. In the end, it's as if we if we can build skills, digital skills, faster than we do today, they will be absorbed. Uh, companies will hire every single one of those, um, and they will accelerate the digital transitions. And if many businesses do that, we will see faster growth. It's kind of almost as simple as that. And you're right; it's doubled. We also we already had this. <laughs> so I have another one for Mark. <laughs> Mark, as we discussed, StarMind develops AI platforms, so I can imagine um, to do this, you need highly uh, qualified um, people, employees. What is the profile that you are searching for? What uh, yeah, should the talents know? What uh, are the skills they need? Well, that's uh, an interesting, interesting question. Uh, I believe that there, you cannot really answer that in a, in a very simple way. In the end, I believe Zurich, where we are located, uh, is, is actually a very good hub for, for, for data scientists, for engineers, uh, for, for all kinds of uh, more data-driven uh, data uh, jobs and, 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 and tasks. But uh, I believe what the hard part about finding the right people is, is I believe, the new generation really wants to have a purpose, why they do what they are doing. So uh, you can be the, the, the best programmer in the world. You probably don't want to work for the NSA uh, in, and, and, and try to listen to every uh, phone call of, 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 of every citizen. Uh, so you really have to build meaningful software. You have to build meaningful uh, applications that create value and that's the best way to attract the right talents uh, even in a in a war of talent here here in Zurich 
Thank you. So we're approaching the end of our panel talk. I have one question that I'd like to hand over to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Our futurist, Get Leonard, uh, just said today we need to rehumanize. Uh, it's a big sentence. Um, I would like to know what your opinion is concerning this topic. Maybe we start uh, with Sergio. Uh, I agree. I agree. Uh, uh, I think uh, we need to human humanize without losing uh, the, 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 um, the opportunity that we have in front of us and the expanded capability that the technology can, can offer us. So at the end, uh, it's not either or, but it's both. Thank you, Sergio. Jan, what is your opinion on that? Well, if, you, uh, if you think about skills are usually considered innate, innately human, like social and um, emotional skills, we do need many more of those. They are almost as scarce as technological skills, uh, or will be almost as scarce. So from that perspective, yes, I do actually hope that we have never dehumanized. So I'm not sure whether we need to rehumanize. Thank you. Mark, what's your opinion? Well, I, I, I fully agree, um, but I also have to say that I believe everyone in here, uh, everyone who has the time to listen to such a conference uh, on, on a Friday, uh, actually lives in, 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 in a bubble. We all, we're all in a very knowledge intense industry. We know that we do have the capabilities, we do have the skills uh, that, that, that make us human beings. But we tend to forget that uh, a, a large portion uh, of the society is actually uh, has spent the last 20 years doing routine jobs, doing, doing the same thing over and over again. And for them, everything we talk about today is, is, is a horror scenario. And, and even though I fully agree for myself, for what we do at Starmind and, 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 and what we do for our customers, I think we really have to be careful about uh, thinking that outside of our bubble, the world is the same. Michelle, also the question I'd like to hand over to you. Do we need to rehumanize, in your opinion? Or we have to keep being humans? Yes, absolutely. I, I fully agree. So people want to belong somewhere. I mean, people leave companies because, um, you know, it doesn't con they don't connect with their supervisor or with their teammates. So yes, absolutely. It's about the human beings and how they interact together. And uh, we've heard that many times. We have to share the knowledge. We have to network. Um, and for that, you need social skills, emotional skills. I absolutely agree, Michelle. I just received one more question that I'd like to hand over to the gentleman. Um, how do we include women in digitalization? Maybe I... Uh, ask this, uh, Jan, first. Well, I, I, I hope they already are included. <laughs> uh, so from an, in our company, we make every effort to, to meet 50% women, not only in our, um, in our new hires, where, where that has been the, the rule for a long time and has also been the reality for a long time, but also uh, among the partnership and among the senior partners. Uh, so we're moving there. For, for full transparency, it, we, we are still struggling a little bit more in our uh, McKinsey Digital Arena. Uh, so it's, it, despite all the extra efforts we take there, uh, we're having more difficulty. Mark, what do you say, women in digitalization, how does it look like in StarMind? Well, uh, may, I, I believe actually AI can help there because um, AI doesn't have these pre uh, preconditions, or that doesn't think like we do, or uh, have, have had an uh, an education that might have not been uh, in in in, uh, in been done in the in the right way in in terms of uh, uh, diversity and so on. So because AI doesn't really care about the gender. Uh, but it does care about the knowledge, it does care about the skills, AI can actually help to really make it uh, unimportant, whether it's a, a woman or a, a man. I think there is a huge chance. 
Sergio, do you agree? Women in digitalization, very important, and on which uh, status is Nokia in that case? We can't hear you. <laughs> Please uh, switch on your microphone. In, uh, in, uh, in Nokia, we truly believe in inclusion and diversity. Uh, I know that all the companies are saying the same, uh, so it's nothing new. But uh, uh, And we are uh, going through a number of initiatives about uh, remove the biases and so on. But I think we need to be also concrete. For example, what we did in Nokia last year was uh, we made an analysis about the unjustified, unjustified pay gaps in the company. Of course, 85% of them, they're women. And uh, we close all of them uh, uh, across the company. Thousands of people. A lot of money, of course, because you can imagine. But I think that we need to put together good uh, statement and good, uh, how to say, uh, ambitions with concrete facts to show that uh, we are moving uh, in the right direction. And in all our uh, um, plan for success, for uh, uh, um, recruitment and so on, we, 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 we really highly consider the, the fact to be uh, less biased as possible. Thanks, Sergio. Michel, women in digitalization. How is the status at Schindler Aufzüge? Yeah, it's a big ambition for us to, to get more women into Schindler in general and more women into um, technical jobs, into digitalization. Um, but it's still a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it, it starts at the schools. It starts in society. So uh, move away from the stereotypes, what are typical um, female jobs, typ typical male jobs. Um, I think there it starts, and we all have um, a part of it. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, gentlemen, for this uh, very interesting uh, panel talk. Thanks for your insights, for um, the experiences you shared with us. We could talk on and on, but uh, time is running. We're at the end of our first panel talk. Thank you very much for being part of it. Thank you for being part at Future Talk 2020 here in Bern via video call, all live, on site. Thank you very much. All the best to you. Stay healthy, stay safe, and hopefully see you next year all together at Future Talk live. And ladies and gentlemen, yes, a big applause. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thanks, gentlemen. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to have a short break of around about 30 minutes. Also for our guests here, we have prepared a cappuccino, coffee and so on. Hopefully you grab one at home or at the home office too. If you want to share your thoughts and experiences um, on social media, please use the hashtag FutureTalk2020 and you can get more information about all our speakers, our panelists and experts on our futuretalk.org website. Don't go anywhere, we're on in 30 minutes. Stay tuned.